This is Roll Call for this edition of African Drums. The African Drums are sounding. Good night and welcome to this edition of African Drums. Today is November the 23rd, Sunday, and as usual, African Drums brought to you by the Coffee to 50 Committee, um, a program actually of the Coffee to 50 Committee, uh, where we keep you informed of some topical issues concerning the community we serve, but also um, our work and program in the community. Um, tonight, we're focusing on another topical issue, actually very topical, the issue of the prorogation of the 10th Parliament. As you know, on the 10th of November, Monday the 10th of November, the President of Guyana, His Excellency Mr. Donald Ramatar, prorogued the Parliament in what was really an unprecedented act in this country, at least in the historical sense. In his address to the nation, um, the President stated that this was done this prorogation to preserve the life of the 10th Parliament. Tonight, I'm joined in studio by, to my extreme left, extreme right, rather, Mr. Kadaki Amsterdam, school teacher out of Buxton. To his left, Mr. Aubrey Norton, registrar of the Critical Labor College. And to his left, my right, Mr. Vincent Alexander, the Registrar of the University of Guyana. These gentlemen tonight will be discussing that prorogation of the 10th Parliament, sharing some perspectives with you. I want to start off, first of all, by welcoming them to the program. So welcome, everybody. It's an all-man panel. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know we did try to get some women on the panel and so on tonight. And, um, but uh, because of other commitments, uh, two of the ladies couldn't make it done. Parliament is the institutionalization of the people's will. The prorogation has left the country in a state of uncertainty concerning when parliamentary democracy will be returned to Guyana. As an introduction, each of you what does this act of prorogation mean for the people of Guyana? I'll start with you, Mr. Alexander. Well, first of all, uh, you, you made the very telling statement that what has happened has suspended uh, parliamentary uh, democracy. I, I do not credit uh, our country as yet with the lofty term, the lofty status of being a complete uh, democracy. It certainly has suspended the, the functioning of the elected and representative organ of the people. The issue of democracy is one probably for uh, another debate, and probably the suspension itself is evidence of what I'm speaking about. Uh, I think that this has left the country uh, in a crisis and in a state of uncertainty left the country in a crisis because the president when he announced the prorogation of the parliament 
at the same time said that local government elections will be held in the second quarter of 2015. Now, the fact of the matter is that the Parliament in 2012, if I'm not mistaken, postponed the local government elections to 2013 and there has been no subsequent parliamentary act of postponement since then. So it's an absurdity for us to be told by the executive that they will be having these elections in the second quarter of next year when in fact they are in breach of the constitutional obligation to have held them in 2014. Those elections are due and should be called immediately because as we sit here, the executive is in breach of the constitutional provision in relation to local government uh, elections. So in a sense, what we have done, what this prorogation has, do, has done, uh, in conjunction with the announcement of, the post of those elections sometime in 2015, is, is really a, an insult to the constitutional instruments uh, of this country. And I say that not only because of the elections, but because of other factors. This thing of prorogation has been handed down from the independence constitution. However, if one reads the 1968 constitution, which was on the eve of the Canada becoming republic, it speaks about prorogation in a context of a majority operation. If one sees the text there, you see the text speaking to the question of the President on the advice of the Prime Minister being able to prorogate, but it also goes on to talk about the, the, the Prime Minister having command of the majority of the Parliament, or else the President would then proceed to dissolve the Parliament uh, and, and thus have elections. And so one has to contextualize this institution called prorogation. And it seems to me that it is suggested that it should happen in the context of a majority government and not in the context of minority government. And so in that, in that regard, again, I think that one could say we are facing the possibility of being declared in breach of, of the Constitution by virtue of what the President has done. So he has really induced into our body politic a constitutional crisis. Mr. Norton. Well, um, first, I think one needs to recognize the nature of the government. Apart from the fact that the government is a minority government, historically, if you go through history, and if you look at 1964, for instance, when none of the parties really got a majority, and Dr. Jagan was bent on forming a government on his own, when a coalition was formed between the UF and the PNC and they became the government, I'd make this point to establish first and foremost that the government has no interest in a majority in democracy. What the government has an interest in is domination. What a government intends to do is even if they have 35% and all the rest out of the 65 to ensure that they dominate therefore one has to like vincent says contextual contextualize of okay in this occasion it's a different context the context of the nature of the beast we are dealing with the next point i want to make is that prorogation assumes to apart from vincent's point of of the context in which it was done. It assumes the separation of the head of state and head of government. And I'm, I'm choosing this because every time you look at them on television, 
they talk about Canada as if it is an arbitrary act of the head of state and fail to recognize that there is an independent titular head outside of the prime minister. In Guyana's context, what you have is the president against whom this vote would be made acting arbitrarily. I want to make the point as well that the con it could have never been the intention of the constitution that if a no confidence, why would we put a confidence vote in the constitution and then turn around and give the president the power to stop the no confidence vote by proroguing parliament. To me, there's an absence of logic there. So, I believe the section on prorogation was misused. I don't like to add the concept of, democ of democracy with the PPP at all. Their history doesn't suggest democracy. The history suggests domination. I believe what has happened here is that the PPP, in an attempt to stay in government as long as it can, decided they will abuse power. And what is required is a robust response from the people of Guyana. My own view is the average man in the street, the average person, thinks the prorogation is a bad idea and the attempt to rationalize it by the government to me is a failed attempt each and every one knows full well the only reason it was done was because the ppp does not want parliament dissolve and they go to an election have to go to an election so in my opinion what they're doing is basically bidding time and as they bid time, one has to analyze what they're doing. Because to me, the opposition needs, on the one hand, an active program to confront the government, while at the same time, on a parallel line, putting in place the organization for elections. That to me is where we should be. Kadaki, <laughs> the last word in the introductory statement. Well, the, the last word. Where does the prorogation leave the nation? Or I, I like to ask myself, what message does it send to the nation? The prorogation in this instance, um, in my mind, while the president, etc., argues that it is legal, it is based on the Constitution, um, I think at least it is unethical it is immoral like vincent and aubrey said the clause which deals with prorogation in the constitution in my mind would have um, been looking at it from a point of view of the majority here it is we have a group of people who do not command the, um, the majority saying to those who command the majority we are going to shut the door on you and we will shut the door on you so that you can come talk with us. Um, I was saying to a friend yesterday, it's like you kicking your wife out of the house. Get out. And she's in the pouring rain. Mm -hmm. And saying, girl, let me negotiate this thing. Mm -hmm. It can't start like that. You can't negotiate on the duress. You can't have me in the rain, exposed to the weather, and telling me negotiate. So, what this prorogation really says to this nation is that we are in charge and whatever we do you have a choice to accept and um, not even reject because you listen to the president as he referred to the statement by um, Mr. Greenwich when Mr. Greenwich said look we're going to review all of these contracts these agreements which are signed during the period of prorogation. His response to one reporter was, I am the government. Mr. Greenwich is not. That is bullyism. That is domineering. And because of that very nature of the 
PPP. I think that the opposition has erred. Has erred in the lead up to the reconvening of parliament because as, as far as I see, um, they put all the cards on the table, all in the open. So the government basically knew what was coming and how they ought to deal with that or how they plan dealing with that. They erred in that sense. And they erred in the sense of not organizing in the communities even before the reconvening of parliament so that you could have had bodies on the streets in front of the parliament indicating to this government that we stand in support of our elected representative. I, I, I blame the opposition for that failure. At least I see it as a failure. Mm -hmm. And uh, the country, therefore, is currently in a state of limbo. The man on the street would like to see some action taken. The man on the street would like to send a clear message to this government that this is not what we want. But at the same time, it would appear as though leadership is lacking from the elected, re the elected representatives. Okay. Some some words, some introductory words, really setting the stage for what we're going to talk about tonight. Again, if you're just joining us, we're talking about the prorogation of the, ninth, of the 10th Parliament here in Guyana, the act by the President, very unprecedented, on the 10th of November. Uh, we have just heard some introductory points from our panel here. The panel includes Mr. Aubrey Norton, Registrar of the Critical River College, uh, Mr. Vincent, Vincent Alexander, Registrar of the University of Guyana, and Mr. Kadaki, Amsterdam. Buxtonian and school teacher. Um, we, we, okay, sure enough, this act, I think there's consensus. This act was the kind of act that people should not accept. Definitely. Um, Mr. Alexander called it a constitutional crisis. This has thrown us into a constitutional crisis. I think if we can delve a little bit deeper into that, because let's put aside for a moment strategy on the part of the political parties or anything like that. Let's talk about the deep issue here of constitutionality and democracy. You mentioned in your introductory remarks that the President and the Government of Guyana has quoted particularly Article uh, 72 of the Constitution that seems to suggest for them that this is authorized. Can we deal a little bit more with that? Can we explain to the people what does this article in fact say? Um, and if in fact it gives this power to the president, is there a justification? Well, first of all, <coughs> the article on them says that the president may prorogate the parliament at any time and that that prorogation could last for a period of six months. It does say that. But as I said earlier, one has to contextualize what's in the Constitution. And the earlier point I made was that if one look from a historical perspective, and in contextualizing a Constitution, one can take a historical perspective. One could see that the earlier provision for prorogation in the Independence Constitution was far more detailed and referred the need for the Prime Minister at that time to be in a majority position if he was in fact going to be asking the, the President to prorogate the Parliament. So that's the first aspect. The Constitution reform introduced the new provision of a no confidence vote. There was no no confidence vote in the, up to the 1980 Constitution. It is only in the 2001 enactment that was introduced the question of a no confidence vote. There is undoubtedly a collision between the no confidence vote and the president's authority to prorogate. There is undoubtedly a collision. And therefore, from a constitutional and legal perspective, one also has to look to see what occurs in the instances of collision because the Constitution could have never intended 
to have a no confidence vote that cannot be realized. To use the terms of <laughs> the Attorney General, the law is not an ass. Which Attorney General? The, the servant Attorney General. <laughs> the law is not an ass. And I think there are other legal luminaries who, given the absurdity of the matter, would assent that, dissent that kind of language. The law could never have intended to have a situation where you have a provision providing for a no confidence vote and at the same time to have a provision that ensures that the, the president at his whim or fancy can negate a constitutional provision and so one has to look to see how could the law facilitate those two provisions at the same time no. and I would argue on that score that it is a legal norm that where there's a collision of laws or a collision of articles, that the most recent gains precedent over the previous. Mm -hmm. And in this instance, the no confidence provision is more recent than the provision for prorogation. And so one could well argue the case that the law, using the principles of the common law, that where there is this collision, then no confidence has to be given precedence over prorogation. And that therefore we see again that there is a defiance of the application of the legal principles uh, that are supposed to inform the way we practice in our common, uh, in our jurisdiction. So that there is a legal interpretation, and I think that we should be exploring the legal, possi legal possibilities for judgment on this matter because it's certainly a matter that is now conflictual and requires a judgment and uh, you should know that in the case of Guyana the final judgment will be the Caribbean Court of Appeal. Okay. Mr. Norton, what does no confidence mean? I mean, we have been talking about it and for the person out there person like myself, what does no confidence mean? Is this simply an act within the parliament, a uh, presentation of some documented statement? What does no confidence mean, really? Well, first you have to go back. If you're talking democracy, then when you elect people to the National Assembly, they are the representatives of the people. Now, it is assumed in most jurisdictions that governments will control a majority. We have the unfortunate situation where you don't need to form a coalition or the constitution doesn't provide for you to form a coalition after and therefore you'd be the majority and so the PPP emerged as a minority in the parliament but in charge of the government. Now, in a democratic society, as I understand it, the will of the people must prevail. And the best yardstick for use for this is the PPP. I sat in the last parliament, and whenever you challenge the PPP, they made the point that we are the majority, we are the government, the people elect us, we should be allowed to go ahead. Now, they don't want that. They don't want the majority that is elected to govern. So what in essence happened here is that the constitution provides for if there is, well it goes down in the form of a confidence motion, but if the majority in the parliament decides that it has no confidence in the government to the day, they can bring a motion and once that motion is passed, almost with automaticity, the government is expected to close off its activities, just like a take care, caretaker, and in three months call an election. What the government did is to decide, look, we can't go to an election now. Because it is well known that their support base is dwindling and that 
even people who are staunch PPP are now saying that it's a kleptocracy, a group of thieves parading as a government. And so they find themselves in the situation where they don't want to go to the electorate because they believe they will lose more seats. And they don't want the government to be dissolved. And they created the constitutional crisis by choosing Article 70, which, which was never intended to stave off a no confidence vote as the branch under which they will take cover. In that process, they have generated a constitutional crisis and established in no uncertain terms that they are undemocratic in nature, immoral in approach, and they don't care anything other than political power. Now, that is what makes the constitutional crisis a difficult one. Because if you're in a constitutional crisis, you'd expect rational thinking, the law to take its course. In this case, what is going to happen is raw political approach in which the government seeks to do everything to stay in power. What that does is leave the opposition no option but to confront the government. There are those who call for street protests. In a different circumstance, I would have said yes to street protests. In this circumstance, I will say no. And I'll say no to street protests because the PPP is desperate. And once you have street protests, what they're going to do is, you know, when you're corrupt, you have a lot of resources at your disposal. And they're not short on money. So they are going to pay people to beat Indians. And when that happens, they will return to the communities to campaign to say, look what has happened. So on that basis, I believe that street protest should be of a real last resort. But I also believe there are a number of other things you can do to put this government to its place. And in my opinion, the opposition leadership needs to start thinking. And if they just think hard, they will come up with about eight options that can make this government understand that it is people that matter. It is the people who have said, hi, you are qualified to be a government. You are a minority. We also have got to understand that these people have no respect for law. A critical element of democracy is the rule of law. The question of the president assenting was never intended again for it to be used where they are legitimate, as I understand it, I haven't read it recently, but I remember the university student be reading it, was that if you had concerns, within 21 days, if I remember clearly, you would have stated your concerns in writing and it goes back to parliament or whatever. What the government has done is transform this into a dictatorial tool to ensure the people's position never see the light today. So, they are not the, the president isn't assenting to any bill that he thinks doesn't uh, pursue their interests. In this regard, the people doesn't, don't matter, and democracy is under threat. And so I think the leadership in this society, both civil society and the political opposition, need to put some more thinking into it and start to act. For instance, I can't understand, unless people are afraid of the hard work, why is it you can't organize a campaign to go to minibus drivers and organize a one-day strike of minibus drivers talking to higher cars so that you paralyze it for a day or two and then signal the government if you don't reconvene parliament, there will be another action. Some of them I don't want to see on television because the government will prepare for them. But I think if the leadership of the opposition sits down and think and produce a plan, the government could be dealt with and they'll be dealt with condignly. Wow. Now, 
we have focused a lot on talking about this from a political dimension. I mean, we've been, been talking about the political parties, obviously, um, parliament, parties, government, um, party, politicians. But this issue, this crisis that we're faced with, it's, it's, it, it goes deeper. And I, and I think that you were hinting to that as well, Mr. Norton, and, and you as well, Mr. Alexander. You too, very early on, Mr. Amsterdam, hinted to that, that this, this goes beyond differences between political parties, as we can see from time to time in the parliament. I mean, we've seen many issues in the, since, it, since this parliament, the, the 10th parliament, uh, that have confronted um, that have been presented to the nation um, as political issues, um, issues of difference. This issue, though, is an issue that is at the core of citizenship, at the core of Guyanese hood, and at the core of what it means to uh, to have your voice heard in that sense of civic engagement. So, my question is, what do you see is the role? of quote unquote the layman in this process? I, I think the layman has one of the more um, important roles. But um, the, the way this information has been reaching the layman, um, in my mind, uh, to some extent, has um, caused some amount of hesitation, let me say. Um, number one, we keep talking about prorogation not um, being insulting or insultive to anyone but the average citizen really doesn't understand clearly what this prorogation thing mean I remember looking at a um, Vox Pop Vice of the People um, on one of the television stations and uh, a large percentage of the people interviewed were honest in, in, enough to say you know um, I don't know what this thing is about I didn't even know that it had happened. Right? So community leaders need to start a process of education. Meet their followers, if we can call them that. The pastor on the pulpit needs to explain to his congregation what is this thing called prorogation. It's a suspension of the parliament is a putting out of your representatives from parliament, closing the door and say, y'all ain't got no voice. That is what people will understand. And then let them really recognize that this government is really not willing to allow their representatives to represent their interests. And I think that is when the, the average man is going to really um, become more involved in this thing because obviously everybody wants his or her interests to be represented, his or her voice to be heard through his or her elected representative. And therefore, we as community leaders, etc., need to touch base with the grassroots and explain the old concept of prorogation, the old suspension of parliament, and what are the effects. And then, like Ari was hinting, formulate different strategies for dealing with it, for sending a, a message to the government that this nonsense has to stop and it has to stop quickly. And I, I think um, if we are able to do that, then this government will come very quickly to its senses. Because while people are seeing this um, suspension of parliament as being um, directly related to the no confidence vote, I think it is deeper than that. There are many questions that exist in Parliament. Questions, for example, to the Finance Minister. The Finance Minister, I think, was supposed to be taken to the Committee of Privileges. Um, we got a CFATF um, bill. They are all the local government bill. They are all host of things which this prorogation really has an effect on. And I believe um, the, the PPP and Ramatar was looking deeper than no confidence vote because they saw a way out of all of these things with which they are confronted because the fact is so long as you prolo um, prorogue parliament all of the things all of the issues all of the questions etc die a natural death 
and I think um, that is what the PPP used in my mind as an escape from all of these things that they were confronted with. Well, maybe when you I, I want to make a quick point. Yes, here. please go ahead. Any student who goes to the university and do a political science course, in the first year, they learn the functions of a political party. And one of the functions of a political party, which I believe those who are in politics should know, is really to explain to the citizenry the political issues and the ramification for them and the society. Our political parties in recent times have failed miserably not only to socialize them into politics and mobilize people but that signal function of explaining and giving clarification to political issues has fallen through the crack and political parties are not going to be effective if they won don't have people in their public relations and education program who can explain the issues and that's a grave failing of political parties at present so I agree with him and a lot of what the inaction of the Guyanese people is because in my opinion we have failed to clearly explain to them the prorogation and to motivate them to want to act to ensure the government behaves itself. Now, I think the opposition has allowed the government to arrive at the conclusion that they can do whatever they want and get away with it. And so, though we're in a constitutional crisis, the society moves on as if it is business as usual. That is unfortunate. Mm. In fact, when Ben Kedaki was speaking and he said um, nonsense, I thought he was going to use the phrase from another famous Boxtonian, confounded nonsense, um, and that confounded nonsense has to be stopped. Um, let's turn attention a little bit to six months down the road from now, two months down the road, three months down the road. Um, we know that the current act of prorogation can last a maximum of six months. Um, within that six months, people are very unsure what could happen, both from legal standpoint, practical standpoint, political standpoint, what are some of the things that can be of impact and concern to the ordinary person um, within this six month period? Are we likely to see a return to Parliament soon? And if we don't, what are those practical and political considerations for the ordinary person? My, my own take on the matter, if one takes um, what the president said, was that somewhere within that six month period, the president will attempt uh, to call local government election. You see, one has to look at the, the entire complex that's, that's at play right now. The People's Progressive Party has paid significant attention to GCOM over this period. And one of the mantras that they have been referring to is that GCOM says they need six months to prepare for local government elections. And so I think they're going to try to ascend some moral high ground by announcing the government elections somewhere within that six month frame of prorogation and to say that they are being responsive to the opposition by doing so but that they could not call these elections earlier because of GCOM's need for six months. Now the fact of the matter is that GCOM said some time ago that they require six months from whichever time the government intimates. And the government has withheld that intimation for all of 2014 and will now pretend as if the problem is GCOM and it's six months. GCOM six months could have started June this year, 
It could have started me. It could start even now. So that the question of public education again becomes very important for the people to understand the game uh, that is being played. The calling of those elections will be intended also to be an attempt to postpone national elections and to try to go back into the parliament and say, well, look, we have these elections that you call for and therefore what's the issue now? That the no confidence vote itself was premised on the fact that there were no local elections. We now call in those elections. And business should be as usual. It should hardly be noted that our legal system deals with all of these matters. If the parliament is dissolved because of a no confidence vote, the government has called the elections and GCOM has three months within which to run out those elections. That in no way, no way interferes with six months for local government elections. And in fact, the law specifies that where there are two sets of elections to be held, national. that the national election supersedes the other. So both in terms of the time frame and in terms of the legal provision, the national election will supersede the local government election. So there's no need for us to play around with these dates of elections. The law makes provision as to how any clash between elections uh, would be dealt with. So to a large extent, one may well see that what the government is doing, in some regards, they're playing for time. They're probably hoping that the time will allow them to put themselves in better shape for an inevitable and eventual um, elections. So that's a part of what's what's okay. playing out here. What about the, the, the spending issue? I think that one has been attracting a lot of attention. Yes. Well, the spending issue, I think, there are two aspects to that as well. We already have the history of the government using the contingency fund in a manner that has been questioned. And so that is one aspect of how they probably perceive that they can proceed to spend. There's also a provision, a tradition, a practice that in a new fiscal year, since the budget can be withheld until April of that year under our legal provision, March. that April 1st, you have three months in, in which that what the government will seek to do is to use the tradition of drawing down a fraction of the previous year budget for the administration of the affairs over those three months. So you, they have three windows. You have the monies that are not in the consolidated fund, the lotto money and other such monies. You have the use, misuse of the contingency fund. And in this circumstance, there was also the misuse of the provision to draw down a fraction of the previous year budget to conduct the affairs in the first three months. So I think there are areas in which the government has obviously applied its mind as to its way forward. And therefore, it is, it is for the opposition in that context to equally apply its mind as to the way forward. Because what we're seeing here is the defiance of the will of the majority. And I think that is the critical issue that is before us, that the government does not want the majority to have the say that it should have. I always remember when I myself was a parliamentarian for a period 2001 to 2006, that in parliament the, we were boldly told by one Mr. Nadir that the opposition will have its say and the government will have its way. <laughs> I mean, the immorality of that is so <coughs> crass. But he, he said that. And what we see here is an attempt, even now that they are a minority, is for the minority to have its way and the majority only to have its say. Mm -hmm. So you can see there are no principles at play here. It's a pure power play uh, that's involved. And so I want to make the other point that 
we don't live in a society that has matured to the point where we have accepted some basic principles that should apply across the board. And that is where the electorate in some regards may even be divided. It is not principle and policy that drives the way our electorate behaves. There are other factors, and, and to a large extent there are ethnic factors. And therefore, the government can gamble on that in the face of the defiance of principles, which in other societies would have had them out of government a long time ago. If you're just joining us um, tonight on African Drums, we are joined by a panel of distinguished gentlemen. Um, you were just hearing from Mr. Vincent Alexander, who is the Registrar of the University of Guyana, but you should also say that he is a commissioner on the Guyana Elections Commission. Um, we are also joined here by Mr. Aubrey Norton, Registrar of the, Univer of the Critical Labour College, himself a former parliamentarian. Uh, for the People's National Congress, People's National Congress Reform, and Mr. Kadaki, uh, Kadaki Amsterdam, a school teacher from the very um, famous um, historical community of Buxton. And tonight we're talking about the prorogations. In these last few minutes, if you're just joining us, we're talking here about the prorogation of the Parliament. Mr. Norton, one of the, um, the, the things and and and. and Mr. Alexander just uh, alluded to it, I think, it has to be how it is that citizens organize themselves um, to respond and to also represent their concerns um, in relation to the propagation issue, especially their fears about the misuse of funds or the denial of funds for other things under the pretext of prorogation or limitations, the pretext of limitations of the prorogation. Particularly um, communities that Coffee to Fifth Committee works in are communities that are organizing themselves, they are um, working to rebuild their communities, they are working out issues of self-reliance and so on. In this period of uncertainty, what should those communities and community leaders be focusing on? You, you've addressed the question to Mr. Norton, but if I could jump in here. <laughs> okay. um, it is my view that prorogation or no prorogation, that what is required in this country is for communities to take their destiny into their own hands and for much more work to be done at the community level because I think that the community approach to development has to be one of the approaches that we use for development in this country and in that regard I would say that the present situation provides an opportunity for the communities to become more active in pursuit of their own empowerment and, and therefore, prorogation becomes, for me in some regards, an opportunity for mobilization and for people taking their destiny into their own hands. It's not I agree with Vincent, um, but I believe that you have prorogation as a political issue, and therefore it needs political leadership. Therefore, to me, the first thing that has to happen is one has to analyze the intentions of the government. One has to analyze where the government intends to go. And then one has to, having analyzed the situation, work out the response. I believe the response has to be at a number of levels. First, you've got to convince each individual that to allow this to continue is to ensure that the government dominate you for life. At the family level, people have got to educate their children to understand the implications of this. And at the community level, I believe 
what Vincent said is true. It's an opportunity for self-reliance. But it is also an opportunity for political remobilization. And what needs to happen is that each village should be politically remobilized and be prepared to take whatever action is required to ensure that the government is brought to its senses. At the village level, the political leaders need to go in and speak to people in those villages. Motivate them. I believe the big problem is the absence of motivation. I sat one night and looked at a television program in which people were attempting to talk to people, and for me it was a comedy. I mean, I came from a background where Vincent will tell you in the 1997 protests, we sat down, we analyzed, and whenever you went to the television, you had clear messages and approaches to people. I believe that is required. I also believe that the opposition is making a mistake. They continue to operate as APNU and AFC. I think the time is nigh where while they operate like that, there should be regular meetings to create an opposition front so that there is cooperation and coordination between the two with the aim of dealing with the government. Now you cannot effectively deal with the prorogation with the AFC acting as the AFC and the APNU acting as APNU. They have to develop some modus bibindi and operate within it. Both entities can be different but they need to strategize together and to bring a, a national opposition front to take on the government. Now, in that process, they must also focus on educating the army and the police. The government is left with only one option, basically to misuse the army and the Ghana Defense Force, the, and the Ghana Police Force. As an opposition front, you have got to analyze that and work out clear messages to send to the opposition, to the police, and the army. In fact, many of the supporters of the PNC, APNU and the AFC are families of the army people. And they should be talking to them for them to understand that they need to uphold the constitution and not be misused by the PPP, as happened in Linden a few years ago. And so to me, there's a lot of work, but what I'm talking about cannot be done at the level of press conference. It has to be done at the level of hard political slogging in the village. And I think that is what is absent. Well, maybe no, um, and, and as I permit you, also bring in a little bit of the youth aspect, mobilizing and organizing them. I, I, I want to touch on a number of things. Um, are we talking about um, speaking to people from the point of press conference? Um, I want to go further. Your organization cannot be effective if you speak to people only at the square of the revolution. Everybody around this country who needs to be alerted, who needs to be educated, cannot find themselves at the square of the revolution in a big meeting. I am. Um, I was. I want to say unfortunate to go to the meeting that was held at the Square of the Revolution because I spent hours there and I left without knowing what the course of action was. And um, that's a failure on the part of the organizers. That's my opinion. Um, this, this jointed approach between the AFC and the um, APNU um, points to me, for me, to a deeper problem that we have in this society. I think why the minority government has survived in this country for such a long time is because of this same disjoint. Number one, the people at APNU are afraid of being labeled in a certain way. Likewise, the people at AFC are afraid of being labeled APNU. Because the, the PPP over the years has, um, has continuously argued that the APNU is 
somewhat related to the PNC. Likewise, the um, AFC is an arm of APNU. So every time the opportunity presents itself for these two grouping to come together and take the bull by the horn and deal with this malicious and aggressive and arrogant government, they play this card and the AP, um, the AFC in particular, stays to its corner. Um, we need to get past that. Just as all the Guyanese people as a nation need to get past the ethnic grouping. We need to get past that and it is until we get past that that we'll be able to deal condignly with, um, as Norton said, the kept, uh, kleptocracy that we have. Uh, right. In terms of youth, oh, I want to make a um, yeah. yes. No, in terms of youth, the belief is, or, or the fact is, the majority of the electorate in the last election, and in any elections to be held around this time, were youths and will be youths. But one of the things which is lacking on the part of the political leaders is the consistent outreach and engagement of youth. Because I believe as long as the, the youths are so educated and kept abreast of the political happenings and the effects of these things on their own um, self-development, etc., they are likely to become more involved and more active and they will let their voices and the energies contribute meaningfully to change in the society. The Arab Spring and all the other um, uprisings that we have had in recent times didn't start in any political office. It started in most instances um, through mobilization from social network and it is youths who have been doing that. But you can only mobilize and you can only participate from a point of being educated and being aware of what is happening. And therefore the political leaders, like was said before, need to find themselves into the communities and do ground work. And when I say political leaders, let me be specific. The political leaders that are on the opposition benches, because there is no doubt that the PPP leaders are finding themselves in the communities and conducting the bottom house um, strategy sessions and so on, and therefore they feel emboldened to take the actions that they take. Also we're talking about the military and the misuse of the military. I think apart from the military, the PPP has their own goon squads that are sitting waiting to do serious damage or assault on the people of Ghana. Mm -hmm. And we have to prepare ourselves to deal with that. All right, we're out I of time. I, wanna make, um, no, I, mean, I wanted to make one clarification. And also, um, your closing. Yeah, I wanted to say, I don't want it to be misinterpreted that I'm talking about a coalition or an alliance mm -hmm. between the AFC and the APNU. I am of the view that the AFC should be stay by itself because I believe it is not in the interest of the wider political struggle for the AFC to become part of the APNU. I don't see coalition as serving the purpose. But what I'm talking about is working together to be able to take on the government while you maintain your separate entities. I want to close my own by saying I believe that what is required here is proper political leadership. And if there's proper political leadership, the government could be brought to its senses. Mr. It's clear to me that this matter cannot be tackled on one front. It has to be tackled on a number of fronts. Uh, I think there's a lot of work that could still be done on the legal front. And there's a lot of work that need to be done in front in terms of education the masses is large. And the third front would then be the political action. Okay. Thanks very much. This has been uh, African Drums, a presentation of the Coffee 250 Committee. If you're with us all night, I guess you are very much interested in the show tonight, discussing a very topical issue, the issue of the prorogation of the 10th Parliament. And here you heard from a panel of three distinguished gentlemen, Mr. Kadaki Amsterdam, a school teacher um, from the community of Buxton, Mr. Aubrey Norton, registrar of the Critical Liberal College, Mr. Vincent Alexander, Registrar of the University of Guyana. 
I've been your host for tonight's show and my name is Norwell Hines. Please continue to check on our Facebook page or this channel for updates about the work of the Coffee Committee. This has been African Drums.